Uh, Robert. Thank you. In my first speech in 2016, and many times since, I've called for comprehensive tax reform. The tax system in Australia, as it exists, is our country's most destructive system. Not just exorbitant tax rates, and I'll give you some figures from the late 1990s, early 2000s, research was done. Someone on the average income paid 68% of their income to government in the form of rates, levies, fees, charges, special charges, special levies. 68%. That means someone's working from Monday to mid-morning Thursday to pay the government. Since then, it's got much more complex and more absurd. And some of the data I'll, I'll give you is more recent. Some of the figures are indicative, not definitive. The ABS average income figure is $100,000. The medium income figure is $67,000. Life is tough for people on the median. In 2015, Joe Hockey said, typical person in Australia pays 50% in tax. Work from January to June to pay the government, and then from July to December, we get to keep. But basically, as I said, people are working at least half the year, probably 68% of the year, for government. And then we think about the tax. Tax on a house, according to News Corporation article a few years ago, and according to recent figures, is 45 to 50% of the house price. Effective tax rate is 80 to 100%. Bread, international accountant, an auditor, Derek Smith in Queensland, says that, and bread, that 50 per cent of the price of bread is tax, which is an effective tax rate of 100 per cent. Petrol, excise and tax varies. At 70 per cent, the effective tax rate is 230 per cent. So a worker on the average income on payday gives 21 per cent of his or her gross income to the government. With what's left, that's 79%, the next day wakes in her house, pays after tax money 80 to 100% to have that house, makes some sandwiches because food is too expensive to be prepared in, in wherever she works, so that is a tax of 100%, and fuel tax, she fills up at the, on the petrol station on the way, way to work, and that, that costs her 230% tax. And then we have GST. GST can be levied on, on bills, including stamp duty, so we got a tax on a tax. So there are two aspects. Actually, there are three aspects. There's the total tax paid. There's the second point is how is it levied? The third point, is it enforced fairly? Ultimately, the people pay a tax in higher prices. So it doesn't matter if a company is being taxed, if an, another entity is being taxed, they pass it on to the customers. Cost of living, inflation, overregulation, and many other factors make sure that today's system of government impositions, government cost recovery, is highly regressive. Look at the carbon dioxide tax and offsets, a UN tax driven by the UN, introduced by the Liberal Nationals in 2015 under Greg Hunt and Malcolm Turnbull, and now ramped up under this government with um, Chris Bowen and Anthony Albanese. So what we've got is a highly regressive imposition of taxation and other charges by the government. So the Australian Bureau of Statistics, as I said, as it shows that the median income is $67,000. So people on that median income are doing it extremely tough because of government and the mishmash that's evolved in the taxation system. So that takes care of terms of reference A and B in Senator Rennick's motion. I agree with. In fact, I agree with all of them. I agree with his whole motion, and I thank him for his motion. As I've said, I've raised the need for comprehensive tax reform many times, so I support this motion. And then we see the core, the bedrock, one of the bedrocks of our, of our federal, uh, federal system and constitution, competitive federalism. That is being converted under the current tax system to competitive welfareism, destroying productivity in this country. The way competitive federalism should work is that it promotes competition between the states. Not cutthroat competition, just, cut, just competition for efficiency. So, as I said yesterday, Joe Bielke Peterson as Premier of Queensland abolished death duties in Queensland. And people moved to Queensland to retire. 
which developed the Gold Coast. And the other states then saw that their people were leaving, so they abolished death duties too. Now we've got Labor, and the Greens I think, wanting to put in place a central death duty, a state duty, centrally imposed, no competition, no accountability. So when you have a marketplace in governance because the states can operate on, according to their needs and the best needs for their best suited for their constituents, then you have competitive federalism, you have a marketplace in governance, and that is priceless. One of the reasons we've got such low accountability in state and federal parliament is that it's too easy for states to blame the feds and the feds to blame the states, as I said yesterday. So the GST undoes competitive welfareism, com competitive federalism, and replaces it with competitive welfareism. It's an encouragement for states, a reward for states like Tasmania and South Australia to be inefficient and not use their resources and still, instead bludge off Western Australia. I mentioned yesterday that systems drive behaviour, and behaviour shapes attitude. And the combination of behaviour and attitudes, along with uh, values and leadership uh, and, and uh, symbols, determine the culture, which is the most important determinant of productivity, security, accountability. Energy prices, as I said, are a huge regressive tax on the poor. Massive record immigration is a huge regressive tax on housing, especially on the poor. So what I'd argue, urge you to think about is, as I list some of these, in, some of these examples, and as Senator Rennick, some of his examples, I'd urge you to think about the impact on our culture in this country. As I said, the tax system is Australia's most destructive system. What behaviours does it drive? We've got the best and brightest accountants and lawyers in this country fighting the government, not helping our producers to fight the Koreans, fight our competitors overseas, the Japanese, the, the, the Chinese, all of our competitors, the Americans. We've got a tax system now that's grown up like topsy. It's a mishmash of dishonest promises to various vested interests for favours. What behaviours does that drive? Is that productive? It's certainly not productive. Inefficient or suboptimal allocation of capital, allocation of resources, inefficient or suboptimal decisions. And a waste of resources, inefficient allocation to minimise tax rather than to maximise wealth and value. And then we have the ATO in the position where it can level complaints against people, against businesses, small businesses particularly, because they don't have the lawyers to back them up. And then, in addition to prosecuting those cases, adjudicate on those cases. How can that be, be justice? It's not justice. And it leads to corruption. And we've seen that in the Australian Taxation Office just a few years ago. And the complexity of various structures that Senator Rennick mentioned, he's got far more experience in, in that than I have. They're unfair to people who can't set up structures. Senator Rennick discussed some of the modern structures and the technologies that have come up. And that increases the need for or the appeal for workarounds. And then we've got something that Pauline Hanson, Senator Hanson, has talked about many years, since 1996. Multinationals basically pay no or little company tax. They use our resources for free. We've got the world's biggest freeloader, the biggest uh, tax avoider in the world, Chevron, taking our gas and sending it overseas, using our infrastructure, using our security forces, using our, our education system and not paying much, much at all for the gas. We've got 90 per cent. This is the figures that I got from Jim Kalali, the former, if we, see if I can remember his title, Deputy, Commission, Deputy Commissioner of Taxation in charge of um, multinational matters and large companies, international matters and large companies. He retired, I think, in 2015 or 2016. I've met him. He said in, in the 90s and in 2010, I believe, 90 per cent, and it's quoted in the newspapers, 90 per cent of Australia's large companies are foreign owned and since 1953 have paid little or no company tax. Who's paying that share of tax? Men and women, working families, since 1953, we've had double ta 1953 double taxation legislation enacted by the Menzies Liberals. We've had foreign companies paying little or no company tax. And then in the 1980s, we had Labor with the Petroleum Rent Resources Tax, making sure that people, making sure that large companies such as Chevron pay little or no tax from the, exporting our gas from the Northwest Shelf. Then we've got transfer pricing rorts and so many other rorts which Senator Rennick went to, into. So. 
we've got the terms of reference C and D are definitely worth keeping. And the tax reform, while it's necessary and arguably one of the most important things in this country, is difficult because the Uni Party, the Liberal and Labor, sees new ideas to scare and, and sees on new ideas and then basically tell lies, misrepresent to destroy a tax system. Paul Keating, as Treasurer to Bob Hawke, introduced the concept of the GST. And later, when John Hewson raised it as opposition leader, who smashed it? Paul Keating smashed it. He destroyed the GST concept, even though he came so close to putting it over the line in Australia. When Pauline Hanson, uh, she wasn't a senator then, when she got hold of the transaction tax, um, it was also sent to Costello by the originators of that taxation system, that taxation proposal, and Peter Costello was asked, as treasurer, and a good treasurer, was asked about it, and he said, sounds like a good system, we must have a look at it. Then Senator Hanson introduced it to the public, and he used it to destroy her, to try to destroy her. Now look at my motion for stopping bracket creep, motion on a Labor bill. Labor said, stood right up there and said, it supports work to remove bracket creep, indexing of bracket creep, but voted against it. The LNP, Liberal Nationals, similar. They stood up, Senator Hume, I think it was, stood up and said, we support uh, removal of bracket creep, the, the stealth tax, the hidden tax, the deceit tax, but they voted against the uh, indexation of bracket creep. And barely a few weeks later, Senator Sharma, in his first speech, said that one of his goals was to get rid of bracket creep. Well, pile on, but just a few weeks earlier, he voted against uh, removing bracket creep. And as Senator Ernick has already mentioned, the tax system has been wangled and mismanaged to protect special interest groups feeding off tax loopholes. In terms of reference E, F, G and H, all necessary. Now, tax is the cost of government. That's necessary. But it's now got to the point where tax in this, in this country of ours is the cost of excess government interference and excess waste, well, all waste. The cost of poor governance, and it's the poor who pay regressively for it. I support Senator Ernick's motion, a step to exposing harm and inefficiencies of the tax system. I think the first way, because of the complexities of the tax system and because of the politics around it, I think the first thing to do is to get an agreement to understand that the tax system is so destructive and so inefficient. And I think that Senator Ennick's motion is a commendable first step to, un, to exposing the, the, um, the inefficiencies and the unfairness in the tax system. Once there's an agreement on the inefficiencies, then we need to develop principles. Not a system, but principles. For example, simplicity, efficiency. The tax system actually collects more than, than the cost of, of uh, implementing that tax. Fairness, objectivity, the fact that it's inescapable so we don't have multinational companies coming here stealing our resources and assets and using our infrastructure and people and skipping the country without paying their fair share. So we develop principles and get agreement on them. And then once that's done, the specific system falls out. So I see Senator Rennick's motion as leading to an important first step in identifying the problems and some of the solutions. And then ultimately take the next step, comprehensive tax reform, define the ultimate system and then the transition, the baby steps to getting there. So I support Senator Ennick's motion.